Welcome to this, the December 2021 Q&A video. We cover Sage's prophecies of doom on Omicron, the attempts to nudge us into doing what the government wants us to do, what climate change means for the insurance industry and why we measure CO2 from the side of a volcano, and much more besides. So let's dive straight in. Since the onset of COVID, what has been the track record of SAGE in terms of their accuracy predicting the progress of the pandemic? Cases, hospitalisation, deaths. As you will know, SAGE have today effectively advocated cancelling Christmas in the UK. For non-UK viewers, SAGE is the acronym for the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies which has been the focus for expert advice to government through the pandemic. And it's an interesting question because scepticism and criticism of the link between this group's advice and government action has ramped up this week beyond anywhere where it had been before. Indeed, there's now a substantial number of government cabinet ministers that have become thoroughly sceptical about the various projections and graphs that are put in front of them as part of the case for government lockdowns or for other restrictions. This gained particular profile this week because of a Twitter exchange between Fraser Nelson, who's the editor of The Spectator, and Graham Medley, the chair of the SAGE COVID Modelling Committee. It came after the latest SAGE papers were published, which generated headlines from predicting up to 6,000 deaths per day from Omicron if we don't implement new restrictions. Medley is professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which published a study last weekend on Omicron, making the case for more restrictions. Fraser Nelson had noticed a note by JP Morgan sent to its clients that observed that all of the scenarios in that study, including the optimistic one, had assumed that Omicron was as dangerous as Delta. If you took the estimates of milder disease from the South African data, it completely changed the picture. Bed occupancy by COVID-19 patients at the end of January would be 33% of the peak seen in January 2021. This would be manageable without further restrictions. Now that obviously makes a huge difference. So why would that scenario not be presented to ministers as well? Preferably with some estimation of likelihood, if that's possible, which, to be fair, it may not be. The standard line is that these are scenarios, not predictions. Since the real-world outcome depends on how people behave, and you can't know that in advance, you can only project the likely consequences based on policy choices, along with certain assumptions. But the problem comes, of course, then that they get published and presented at Downing Street press briefings and then they're widely reported across the media as understood as by the population as predictions. Anyway, Fraser Nelson asked Medley why his group hadn't included a scenario of lower Omicron virulence. And Medley responded, what would be the point of that? Not a snarky question. Genuine to know what you think decision makers would learn from that scenario. And there was some toing and froing, but the answer remained that scenario doesn't inform anything. Decision makers don't have to decide if nothing happens. We model the scenarios that are useful to decisions. Now that caused a stir because, of course, choosing not to do something is just as much of a decision. It gave the impression that government asks the question of its modelers, what's the worst that could happen with this Omicron thing, for instance? Certainly a valid question to ask, along with others. When it sees the result of that question, gets scared at what it sees, shares the grass with the nation's media and brings in new restrictions. And that's a self-reinforcing process, if that's the case. If you asked different questions, you would get different results, likely therefore make different decisions. Supposing they asked instead, analyse the data we have so far on Omicron and model the most likely scenario based on that data, along with variations based on differences between our vaccine status and the demographic makeup of you know, where the studies were carried out, South Africa, and weigh the options we have against the cost of those options, economic and health-wise. Now, such a process may or may not result in a different conclusion. It would arguably be a better process. It's worth stating that the defenders of SAGE say that this exchange has been massively overinterpreted, especially the 
conspiracist interpretation that argues that what Medley was saying was that the government already wanted the policy of lockdown for reasons unspecified, and therefore it just told the modellers to come up with whatever would support that conclusion. You don't have to buy into that sort of thing to feel that there's a problem here in how advice is requested, how the results are framed, and how that then feeds into public policy that gets implemented. That doubt has obviously reached the heart of Cabinet because they had a three-hour meeting that came back with no decision and reportedly the scepticism about the modelling was a huge factor in that. The key is going to be to channel this into a healthy scepticism that asks the right questions that constructively challenges the justifications for proposed policy in a smart way. The less good outcome would be that you just get one tribe that becomes blanket cynical about all data and all modelling, regardless of how valid it may be. But that may well happen, because if you publish this stuff and use it to justify actions, it's fair game. People do notice. So we were warned of a million cases per day, which I questioned last week, and which has now risen to two million a day. And we were warned about 6,000 daily COVID deaths from 10,000 daily hospitalizations. At the peak nearly a year ago, there were on average 4,000 admissions a day and 1,300 deaths. There were no vaccines at that point, no effective antivirals, barely any prior immunity. Now we have 81% of the population double vaccinated. Official data suggests 95% of some antibodies against the virus. So these new figures stretch credibility and you end up questioning the value of the alleged expertise that produces them. Now, Omicron is more infectious. It spreads faster, for sure. But serious illness and death is what we care about, not cases. All right, next question. How much of the ongoing stress, confusion, division, polarisation can be attributed to the rise of 24-7 TV and internet news media needing to fill airtime by use of talking head speculation rather than factual reporting of events. It baffles me that the world is full of a wide range of actual happenings that could be reported, but we're stuck in a speculative loop on a narrow number of subjects. For example, I have no idea what's happening in Syria, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, all former hot news topics, but can watch endless hours of speculation over Christmas work parties of 2020. You're absolutely right, but arguably it isn't new, and partly it's because of us. All the studies show that we care the most about the things that are closest to us. Which is rational, when you think about it. Me, my friends and family, my community, my country, nearby countries, the world. That's the order. It's why when the BBC discusses climate change, it often very quickly focuses in on issues such as eating meat and flying, not the most important issues in terms of climate, but the ones most likely to affect their audience directly, so therefore likely to take their interest positively or negatively. Plus, the media have been so obsessed with the political bubble around government forever. So if there's any whiff of something that might give them the power to inflict damage on a minister or on a government, they will talk about very little else. They are within the Westminster bubble. And yes, you add that to the fact that when we first moved from the news being a half-hour programme a couple of times a day to instead being 24-hour rolling news coverage, then journalists interviewing journalists became the easiest way to fill time while still talking about the same topics. The truth is that you can talk about the other important stuff. I try to cover a range of topics I consider important on this channel, but the viewer figures even before the YouTube algorithm started squashing views by non-subscribers, very clearly reflect that hierarchy of interest. Giving the audience what they want, not what you think they should want, that's generally seen to be a good thing. And particularly when you consider that original journalism is expensive, getting people to chat about their opinions is very cheap. Even at the YouTube level, I mean, I could do several videos a day if I simply chatted to camera about my opinions on the issues of that day. And if I made them suitably spicy, it would be a lot more lucrative than what I actually do, which is spend several days researching a deep dive video to explore all the detail of a topic. 
Whether you follow the audience or seek to attract it to a place that it didn't know that it wanted to go to comes down to whether you see yourself as having a mission to inform or just to entertain. Now, a good mainstream news channel, as the BBC used to be, would work hard to increase your awareness and your interest in the important issues and will treat the minority who do know those things are important as one that needs to be served, even if it's not the largest audience. And that still happens to an extent with the BBC, but to a significantly lesser degree, because they see they have to compete with very dynamic algorithms now, and so they go with the flow. All right, next question. I enjoyed your dissertation on man-made climate change, but for something that bugs me, why are they so frequently quoting CO2 levels from the top of Mauna Loa when it's well known that volcanoes extinct or active ooze out levels of carbon dioxide 24-7? Indeed, Mauna Loa, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, is an active volcano. It last erupted in 1984. CO2 started to be measured there in 1957 by the scientist who was the first to make accurate measurements of CO2 in the atmosphere, one Dave Keeling. It's used now because, because of that, it has the longest continuous record. Now, he selected the site high up on the northern slope of a mountain, four miles away from the summit, about 11,000 feet above sea level. He chose that spot because he wanted to measure CO2 in air masses that would be representative of the wider environment and away from localised emissions from human activity or indeed from plants or from soils. Most of the time, they are measuring clean air that's been over the Pacific Ocean for days or even for weeks. And this gives a steady reading and it's calibrated with weekly samples taken at 60 other remote locations around the world. The Mauna Loa CO2 readings match very well those other measurements taken at similar latitude, so it confirms that the volcanic CO2 doesn't routinely affect the results. Which is not to say that it never does, but when it does, it's obvious. So they say this on their website. We only detect volcanic CO2 from the Mauna Loa summit late at night at times when the regional winds are light and southerly. Under these conditions, a temperature inversion forms above the ground and the volcanic emissions are trapped near the surface and travel down our side of the mountain slope. When the volcanic emissions arrive at the observatory, the CO2 analyzer readings increase by several parts per million and the measured amounts become highly variable for periods of several minutes to a few hours. In the last decade, this has occurred on about 15% of nights between midnight and 6am. And they show an example graph giving the distinction. Those are removed from the global averages. And so you can take about what you will, but it seems like a reasonably good explanation to me. Next question. It seems that the media and the government are becoming somewhat selective about the information they present in areas such as climate and COVID, presumably to promote the correct policies. Is this a justified nudge or unnecessary coercion? Well, look, I'm going to agree with the spirit of your question in a minute. First, I have to be annoying and pick apart the assumptions in the question. Because I would generally be wary of such perceptions because they're highly susceptible to confirmation bias. We notice the things that go one way and discount the ones that go the other. There's a story that Julia Galef talks about in her book, The Scout Mindset. A journalist got triggered by a couple of emails that came in on a Monday morning and she fired off the following tweet. Monday morning observation. I have PhD in my email signature. I sign my emails with just my name, no doctor. I email a lot of PhDs, their replies. Men, dear Bethany, hi Ms Brookshire. Women, hi Dr Brookshire. It's not 100%, but it's a very clear division. The tweet got viral approval from various women saying that that was their experience too. But she became aware that she'd based it on a rough impression. She decided to test her own claim and went through her email archive. Now, that's good. Not many people would actually do that. And OK, ideally, you would do it first, not afterwards, but even so. And of course, you can see the punchline coming. She found that she was wrong. Out of the male scientists, 8% called her doctor. Among female scientists, 6% did likewise. She did a follow-up tweet to own up to having been wrong. Now, that may be a diversion from answering your question, but I can't answer a question whose premise may be completely false, but is based on an impression. 
and supplemented as well by mind reading, that if they're doing such a thing, it must be to promote correct policies. I mean, you may be right, but I would rely on data, not on general impressions. What we do know for sure, because it's documented, is that the government has been using psychological techniques via the so-called nudge unit to seek to maximise the public's compliance with COVID restrictions. The media started going along with this, but whenever their own fascinations, such as getting the opportunity to attack and undermine a controversial public figure, or indeed the government generally, whenever that got in the way, they would immediately dump any commitments to promoting the correct policy and join the feeding frenzy instead. They pushed the one rule for them, another for you line, because it was calculated to bring down Dominic Cummings originally, then Matt Hancock, and now latterly Boris Johnson. It also erodes public willingness to go along with the government's COVID restrictions, so against the correct policy. But that was clearly not the priority for them in that instance. The fact is, with the media it's complicated, because they have their own interests, their own incentives, that are not aligned with that of the government. They do routinely seek to manipulate public opinion, but that's not exactly new. The government nudge unit, though, is definitely a thing, and its use of psychological insights for public policy, that is also new, and I believe it's a huge amount to answer for in ramping up fear across the community. We were in a situation where we needed to respond, but when people are terrified, they don't evaluate risk clearly, they don't think rationally, it doesn't lead to better outcomes. This leads to multiple questions. First, do you even have the right, even if your aims are noble, to manipulate people for government policy? Now, that's a harder question than you might think, because sometimes the answer is yes. All persuasion is a form of manipulation, and we don't expect politicians never to seek to persuade us. Changing online data consent processes so you have to opt in to have your data shared rather than having to opt out to prevent it. That's exactly the sort of low end example of a nudge and it's not at all nefarious. So there is a line. At least that's the question. Is there a line? If so, where is it? Second, at what point does your ability to influence people without them realising begin to undermine the basic principle of democratic choice? Because demagogues have always tried to invoke fear of the outsider to keep their support high. Such techniques are hardly new. But does the addition of scientific precision to our influencing ability mean that a government that truly wields such a power without conscience would become unremovable? Now, luckily, the answer right now seems to be no, because nudging has not prevented Boris Johnson's government from reaching the very edge of a precipice and falling in popularity. I know that some have been talking recently about a collaboration between Sky Television and the Nudge Unit to try to bring popular programming to bear in nudging the population on climate behaviours. So you do things like normalising characters in soap operas, recycling, or reducing their meat consumption, or whatever it is. Is that nefarious? Well, we already established societal norms through such programmes. In the 1970s, domestic abuse was often excused, casual genuine racism was often excused, and TV soaps role-modelled better behaviours, and mostly we didn't see that as a bad thing. Society through history have role-modelled culturally desirable behaviours, often in ways that individuals experienced as quite pushy and oppressive, actually. But it's one thing to reflect one's values and another to proactively model psychological acceptance for a political change programme, whatever the merits that programme may or may not have. And it seems to me that's different. But I don't know. I'd be interested to know what you think. Let me know in the comments right after you've hit that like button, maybe. Just a suggestion, not a nudge, or not a nefarious one, anyway. Next question. There's a lot of buzz around nuclear fusion lately, since many companies are now claiming that they will have a working reactor on the grid within the next few years. Meanwhile, France's nuclear grid just had to be shut down briefly for unexpected repairs and maintenance. 
Do you think that nuclear energy could be the dream fuel that we hope it will be, or does it have more limitations than proponents of this energy type are willing to admit? I won't claim to have been following the recent advances on nuclear fusion that closely, but my general impression is that people are talking it up significantly beyond what's merited. For instance, incorrectly reporting how much energy you would get out over the amount of energy that you have to put in. Figures often ignore the amount of energy that's needed to create the so-called plasma state where fusion can even take place, and they often ignore the fact that you have to convert the energy coming out into electricity, a conversion which would probably be under 50%. I wouldn't hold my breath on the fusion breakthrough just yet. But I may be wrong. Again, if you know something I don't, let me know and maybe it will feed into a next deep dive video. There's rather more progress simply on fourth generation standard nuclear which is solving key problems such as making the reactors safer, so if they're interrupted they safely shut down rather than catastrophically melting down, and reducing the production of waste, even using some of the previous high-grade waste as future fuel. I think all of that will begin to pay dividends in the next decade if the technology is allowed to develop in the face of ideological objections. Okay, I then had a very long multi-part question, which I need to shorten for the purposes of this video. The essence of it is, how much do we see insurers preparing themselves for escalating climate change related damage claims for fire and flood particularly? And what's going to happen with the people they won't want to cover, such as those that have been allowed by government to build on floodplains whose properties are going to be at high risk? Here's a graph showing the growth of global insured losses worldwide, with storms leading the way in terms of damage, recent years seeing strong contributions from wildfires. This graph doesn't tell you how much climate change is increasing damages, by the way, tempting though it would be to presume so. It more reflects on the growth of the insurance industry in response to a lot more building and population density. But the insurance sector have no interest in being complacent about the likely continued changes in the future, because they've seen at least one dramatic change in recent years. The rise in wildfires has been notable, a 1.7% contribution to the whole from 1981 to 2015, but a 124 contribution since then. The thing about fires is that the improvement of forest management techniques could offset some of the increased risk from weather changes, and the recent extreme hot and dry cells may be an aberration that goes away at least for a while. So insurers have multiple factors that they need to consider when they are working out risk. For most insurers, they calculate risk by looking backwards. They look at the data that gives them the probability that a certain event is going to happen. But if those probabilities are likely to be changing for the future, and you don't quite know how that's going to play out, how do you begin to price that? You would not expect them to start from the basis that it's all likely to spontaneously get better, not worse. Right now, insurer Swiss Re says that it calculates that climate change will expand the pool of at-risk properties from 33 to 41% by 2040. That's an opportunity for new premiums for them, but also a source of likely increased payouts. The recent trend is there. In recent years, the cost of reinsurance policies, the insurance that insurers themselves use to cover the likelihood of major payouts, that has risen. The price of that has risen, indicating growing pressure. And you're right that this is going to create some real conflict. Insurers are between a rock and a hard place in that they need to make a profit, but also to satisfy regulators that require them to keep people covered. As climate change begins to more demonstrably show up the vulnerabilities of certain situations, there will be a fight over who bears the costs of protecting, relocating and rebuilding communities. The question is, at what point does the business model break down? The simple proposition that the companies charge more for premiums than they're paying out in claims. The $5 trillion global industry depends on a lot of people buying insurance and only a small percentage suffering the sort of damage that requires a big payout. That's not going to change tomorrow. But these corporations are looking ahead to multi-decadal timeframes and they're grappling with some serious potential problems coming down the line. By the way, sometimes people say, oh, well, if people really believed in climate change, why would they buy properties on the coast or some of these other at-risk locations? 
but they do. It's what we as a species do generally, in spite of the risk. I noted in my previous video on Neil Ferguson's book Doom that shortly after every volcanic eruption that wipes out a human habitation, humans move right back into that space and begin again. And then probably live successfully and prosperously for hundreds of years before it happens again to the successor community. Why would anyone live today near the San Andreas fault line? We just do. But the cost of doing so is going to go up. Now, the next question is shortened slightly. The determination by government to have the population respond as though every new Omicron infection is as deadly as Delta really should have the reasonably intelligent questioning the motives for such fear-mongering. Ought we not at least think about the reasons why Omicron is being forwarded as just as dangerous and needing more severe measures? And to put this down to incompetence yet again, is this not the realm of the eternally unsuspicious? This was in response to last Friday's video. I think the key is to be neither eternally unsuspicious, nor indeed eternally suspicious. The latter leads you to join up any dots that might lead you to your cynical starting presumption that it's all nefarious. And particularly, don't waste your time with theories that operate on the weird assumption that there's a grand coalition at the top with everyone operating according to a plan. A routine scan of the current available information shows that is not the case. We have a government tearing itself apart because some people want a cautious approach, others are focused on the cost of overly restrictive policies. You have a Prime Minister staring into the precipice, both with the electorate and with his own party, because of his missteps to date. How do you look at that and see nefarious, not incompetence? Now, I have mocked for failure to engage at all with the evidence of lower harm from Omicron, but I know where it comes from. It comes from the fact that A, this thing is massively more transmissible, so if it did turn out that we were mistaken about the seriousness, then the consequences would be significant. B, because people who are paid to focus on worst case scenarios will do exactly that. And of course, what you focus on determines how you think. And C, we live in a country where people have, bit by bit over decades, come to believe that government is primarily responsible for solving our problems. And those people gave the government a serious kicking at the start of the pandemic, accusing them of murdering tens of thousands of people because they were too slow to act. Now, this government does not have the moral fibre not to allow themselves to be trained to be risk averse by that process. And that means that they have been willing to cross lines they should not cross and attempt to micromanage things to the point of absurdity. Now, those are all human considerations entirely in line with the multiple evidence streams relating to what's been done, what we know to have been the interactions between people privately that spilled over into the public domain. There is zero evidence that I've seen for something more deliberative and nefarious. If that were the case, you wouldn't expect it to look as shambolic as it does, and they would be managing public opinion to give them praise and adulation for it, rather than losing public support hand over fist. It's all just the same confirmation bias. Noticing when something fits your theory, discounting masses of contrary data when it doesn't. I did get one other question, the modern monetary theory, but I've taken it as a request for a deep dive video since the scope of the question goes beyond what I can cover here. Otherwise, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks for all the questions, and particularly those from Patreon supporters. Your support helps this channel to keep going. See you all for the final news roundup before Christmas on Friday. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.